course. Um, so I said, um, for those who haven't, had haven't seen the book yet, I mean, you might not really understand what type of book it is. Um, uh, Patrick very modestly pointed out that it has two sides, uh, the, the kind of problems and the uh, resolutions, uh, which is um, true. It's, I mean, as one part is a kind of description of the megacity and its problems, I mean, the Asian megacity in particular, and the other one, I the other side is, if you like, a portfolio of their buildings, and they're being judged a little bit in, in these with these own uh, standards that you invented um, um <laughs> for yourself <laughs> um and uh, but i mean the the common thread in a way is that it is i think uh, a type of book which is rather unusual um these days because it's a manifesto i mean it's it's something that when i started university um which is a long time ago right <laughs> it was still sort of like the thing to do. I mean, people would be writing manifestos, mm, you know, for like a, a thesis or something like that. And and we, we we find, as a matter of fact, there was a very good exhibition just recently called Manifesto, which highlighted some of those um, manifestos again. But I mean, then in the 80s, I mean, uh, again, this was the time that I studied, um, you know, with postmodernism and the criticism of uh, modern thinking, modern planning, and so on and so forth the manifesto more or less disappeared. And you had the audacity to write a manifesto, and not just a, a manifesto on you know, aesthetic issues or architectural issues, but a manifesto on the future of the most problematic thing we can think of, which is the As Asian megacity. So I mean, you, I, I think you, first of all, should be congratulated for this um, courage or uh, naivety, I don't know <laughs> what, what, you know, how to put it, but I mean, I, I really think it's, it's just great. I mean, the book has a, has a fantastic um, range and, and sort of, um, what's the word, sort of ambition, if you like. Um, what is different from the uh, manifestos of the time that I'm referring to is that you are, um, well, you're going far out on, on your hypotheses, but you're also backing it up with work. I mean, and uh, it's been said in the introduction, it's an unbelievable portfolio of work for people who are as young as you. Um, and, and, and some of it, or most of it, is really to the point. I mean, you're, you're, not, you're, you're not proving the point, but I mean, you are kind of going some way towards it, which I think, again, is, is really incredible. And I just recommend everybody to buy the book straight away. I'm, I'm getting percentages tonight, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyway, so <coughs> um, what I so I mean that's the first thing I find unusual and extraordinary. The second thing that I impressed me um, was that you are, I mean, this whole sustainability discussion. I mean, it started off whatever um, in the sixties, I guess, but it became really, you know, more mainstream in the sort of eighties, nineties. And uh, and I think we've sort of reached a you know saturation point because I mean there's a sort of you have uh, uh, energy legislation in many countries around the world now you have these kind of lead standards or BRIAM or you name them the GGNB and so on and so forth and it all seems to be somehow you know a question of uh, rating of somehow real estate um, advantage and so on. And somehow the, the bigger picture is getting slightly lost. We're, we're, we're debating sicknesses of facades, ventilation systems, da da da, details kind of thing. And forgetting quite often, for example, the gray energy that is embedded in these systems that, you know, somehow uh, make the whole thing, let's see, at least questionable. You're approaching again with a kind of very wide angle with a kind of uh, the, the whole city in mind um, and you're t of course talking about your building principles your kind of uh, chimneys ve natural ventilation you've, s you've seen it just very beautifully in the skyville project um, uh, but also uh, you know aspects of urban design mobility networks um, the green ratio and so on and so forth um, and i think this really takes the whole discussion a step further. Um, not that it makes it simpler, I'd say, because it becomes much wider, much more open, uh, and it's it's demanding a kind of more uh, integrated thinking. I would have uh, I would have thought, um, <coughs> but again, for that reason, I think um, the book is um, is very um, unusual. Now, what do you keep on stressing? 
stress. So this is the end of the um, you know accolade now. <laughs> 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 what do you keep on stressing uh, stressing in your in in your um, is the sociability of um, of your of your proposals, right? And there, of course, um, you are um, deep into the field of hypothesis. I would say. I would say. And um, I'd be really interested to have you have you been through um, various scenarios. I mean, have you been thinking? You know, what would what would happen if this goes wrong? I mean, what would be the negative outcome of these? I mean, you know, if, if you think of um, your your um, you're, refer you're referring to as an architect or the city contemporane, you're uh, referring to uh, even Isa Howard, uh, the city, uh, Garden City of Tomorrow, to you, Ferris, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, all of those great visions of which we know, most of, or quite a few aspects of which went wrong, right? Uh, were interpreted wrongly or kind of somehow unforeseen consequences and so on. Have you been going through these types of scenarios for your own ideas? We have. <laughs> uh, I think we, we're very fortunate to be practicing in Singapore because I think Singapore has a benign climate and it also has a benign culture as well. And so it's, in a way, an easier place to experiment because I think the consequences uh, of the failure will be less severe. Uh, for instance, a very low crime environment so this kind of, uh, the, like Skyville has uh, six staircases where you can escape from the police. <laughs> it's really hard to catch someone if you were trying to trap them in that building because they can run up, across, down, uh, out another um, exit. So it would be really terrible probably in, in, in Brazil <laughs> uh, where everyone can do um, uh, sort of parkour uh, acts, leaping from one thing to another. Um, yeah, so I think we are aware of the risks, but we think it's worth experimenting. And we try and experiment in such a way that the failure wouldn't really detract from uh, perhaps the client's objectives for the project. So in terms of Skyville delivering these houses that um, comply with all the standards and are the right size and do all the right things, that part wasn't played with really. So we, in a way, we're playing with the peripheral things that, um, because they're not the core objective, if they don't quite pan out, they're not a core failure either. Uh, and, and so we're aware of that, but where we think the power of these uh, new typologies, so Patrick coined the beautiful phrase, prototypology. So we're, we're really trying to think of what this new city might be and what what would the components of the new city be? And we realize if we don't build fragments of this new city, you can't plan a new city either. You can only imagine 20th century buildings being rolled out bigger or taller or closer together. Uh, and so we think they have a lot of value as experiments um, in that way. I, I, rem I remember a BBC documentary um, with um, uh, Peter Smithson um, and um, uh, talking about their work and he was talking about Robin Hood Gardens and <coughs> he uh, described in his inimitable way how he was totally shocked. I mean, for those of you who don't know Robin Hood Gardens, it's a kind of modernist scheme, uh, housing scheme, low uh, uh, rents um, with the so-called deck, the, deck, deck in the air. The, it was a, a Team 10 idea uh, who had been observing um, behave patterns of behavior in the street I mean how children play in the street and how the, the street to some degree at least um, is a kind of protected space in the neighborhood and they thought because you know more and more car traffic and so on and so forth we should be emulating this idea into a building so the buildings have decks which are like streets and from the streets up down and in they're kind of apartments and so People come out on all on this kind of generous corridors, like a Laubengang, and the idea was the children play there, and it's a, you know the neighbors meet, and it's all this kind of social space and all of that. And the building has just been demolished, actually, uh, despite huge uh, um, uh, protests. It's been it's been always problematic, but 
come back to this BBC uh, thing. Peter Smithson was uh, reporting how they, you know, have been obviously thinking a lot about these uh, future occupants. They were trying. It was really full of good intentions, and we, we reported how on the day of the opening or in the week of the opening, somebody shot into the lift, <laughs> and he just. Just it was out. He just could not imagine that somebody would do that, you know. And the attitude, in a way, to to those good intentions, you know, to this kind of um, attempt to organize people's lives in a better way, you know, in a kind of uh, modern way or in a kind of contemporary way or so on, in, in many cases failed miserably. I mean, there's a huge security problem. They had kind of CCTV everywhere. They had high fences, blah blah blah. You name it. And why does this not happen in Dawson? Uh. I think, well, one very smart thing Singapore did with its public housing was its, its ownership housing. It's not rental housing. Mm. Uh, and it was actually done as a tool of social stability. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew had the insight that if people are invested in the property market, they're invested in stability and growth. Uh, and they're less likely to, to riot. Singapore had race riots in the 1960s um, and was sort of devolving as a so society at that point. Uh, so the ownership really makes people super proud of their houses, makes them vigilant in terms of uh, keeping an eye out for crime. Uh, but the design actually does incorporate all um, the housing developments, um, uh, the board's uh, experience in this informal surveillance and uh, uh, making sure that windows overlook all these areas. So there's very few areas where somebody's kitchen window isn't facing and, you know, in many cases, 20 kitchen windows. So it's, um, uh, that's why I'm saying Singapore has a benign cultural climate and also uh, a sort of strong community uh, investment in it being a safe and secure environment. So. Yeah, I wouldn't do it in a in a um, low end rental environment because I think there would be exactly the same problems where people uh, possibly you know troubled from a difficult background and there's gangs and that sort of thing. It would be an absolute nightmare. But because we knew it was middle middle class and that Singapore as a whole, it's got such low crime that there's big posters up everywhere saying low crime doesn't mean no crime. Uh, to try and get people to stop leaving their wallet on the table. and uh, uh, it, uh, So it's, uh, in a way, they're like worried that there's such low crime that it will cause problems. <laughs> <laughs> How about a little theft today? We even had, uh, at one point, there was uh, uh, people flying in from Colombia, I think, was it, or Chile. There was gangs, jeweled gangs, who were flying in... Uh, 27 hour flight to Singapore and going crazy because they felt it was like paradise for thieves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they finally caught them. Uh, yeah, so I think it's definitely not a solution you can roll out everywhere, uh, but I think it's interesting to even test out some of the things that we have there now. Like, is there too much community space? We don't know. At the moment, some times of the day, some of it is really not very well used, so we're curious um, to see that. Uh, also curious whether people will use the space that they look down on versus going up to the roof. Uh, at the moment, the roof is really popular, and the other spaces are more for like families with kids. So we're doing a lot of study of seeing how it uh, works, um, and I think we'll understand a lot of things uh, from the project and I think that's where yeah we we think worst case is it's fairly underused probably in Singapore so that's not really a terribly um, disastrous outcome oh I I, I I think I've been was it last time or the time before I went up to the pinnacle um, which is a sort of prototype of this uh, type of sky deck and sky garden and so on and so forth and at that time and I think I'm told it's changed uh, already again, at that time, most of the spaces were closed off. They were fenced off, and you were people. There were signs: "Don't use this," or "Don't be there," "Don't go there." I mean, that I think would be the worst because, in in a way, that we a real waste, you know, mm. if, if that happened. But I mean, maybe it had to do with the there wasn't very much planting. There was no much. Money Actually, pinnacle now is yeah. uh, last few times I've been up is really very nice. Actually, functioning right. as a 
as a kind mm. of uh, evening promenade where people go up to watch the sunset Great. and it's jogging right. and it's right. it's quite uh, uh, successful. I think they they suffered from it first being open and then making it closed to the public right. because they had too many strangers coming in and the I residents see. didn't right. like it. Uh, there was some pressure on this project for from the residents to say, no, we want this for ourselves. We don't want outside people coming in. Right. Uh, but it was resisted by the housing board and because it's not in such a central area, uh, you know, you would have to make a fairly special trip there. Uh, so it, it's, it seems to be, you know, reaching a state of, of, of steadiness where it's mostly residents and, you know, some people from the neighbouring mm. surroundings. So, I mean, 900 apartments um, is already quite a, quite a lot for one building. I mean, we're just doing a master plan which also has 900 apartments and I think there are 25 or 27 buildings, something like that, I mean, and <laughs> only four of them by us, the rest by someone else. So, I mean, that's already a big number, but you are actually involved in projects which are even bigger, no? Yes. I mean, I hope I'm not telling any secrets if I'm saying that you r reported of a project, I think Mumbai or India somewhere, where you did how many? Uh, you have to explain, have to tell a little bit Five, the story. 5,000 apartments in one, one development. Um, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is to do with height. I think it, in that building, ha that project has 10 towers. Um, and, you know, if they were four storey, it wouldn't be nearly that number. But interestingly, sort of at the ground plane and the spatial experience, if you don't look up so much, it doesn't feel that different, I think, to a much lower density uh, development. And that's not a, a, a public project, but that's actually... I think it's actually a meet to high end development, so it's it's. Uh, I think that's good. There's going to be less um, problems with that, and I think it's also going to be a gated community, so it's not. Uh, it's it's almost um, a very private estate too. But isn't that? <coughs> aren't you slightly comparing apples with pears when you show, or Patrick is showing kind of pages of slums, um, you know, of the kind of lowest possible social. Uh, position and at the same time you're aware of you know um, the cost and the kind of whole uh, ritual of running a place like Dawson I mean uh, not that Dawson is uh, is a high-end development but it's definitely not a slum <laughs> so um, I mean do you ha do you have a do you foresee any ways of bridging that gap I think it all takes design work and research to, to do it and that so I think it's once you have a kind of model there and then someone comes from Philippines and says, can we build that there and what would we do about crime? I think you can uh, look at the way they deal with it currently in their cities. So maybe they are sort of defensible neighbourhoods and you need to be a, m a member of that village to get in and then everybody knows each other. So I think you can apply social patterns to uh, high density urban constructions and I think they really should mirror the way it already works in society in a successful or workable way. So what we have here is a particularly Singaporean solution. Um, if it was in Nigeria we would really need to know how ordinary neighbourhoods in Nigeria manage to have an acceptable level of um, you know, security and privacy and, and probably replicate that in a way. Uh, but I think the main thing we wanted to show is you can you can create um, amenity in public space at whatever ratio you decide is um, you know most desirable and the thing is um, we don't really know what that is until we test it out yeah, I absolutely agree uh, I absolutely agree and I think that's that's absolutely great and also that you make uh, your research available to everybody I think is fantastic um, exposing yourself to criticism at the same time but I mean I think y you know unless that happens unless you have this communication in the profession I mean th things won't be um, won't be moving on uh, which they definitely need I mean that comes very clear in your book and the, 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 the crisis point at which these cities are uh, at really I mean 90 million I mean that's the size of Germany for one city uh, yes. population of Germany that's really that's unbelievable um, <coughs> well I mean, I think um, maybe you should also kind of include some of the uh, um, audience. I don't know, has anybody seen the book or are there any questions from what you've seen on the, on the presentation? No, 
know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I discussed this with you earlier, Matthias. I listened to your lecture, the, the speech at the World Architectural Festival today. Uh, it was a, for those who weren't there, um, Matthias, it was a presentation basically on the history of, um, of housing in Berlin, but you ended with the problems that exist here in the 21st century and a, a, ra a range, a raft of solutions that, that you were proposing. As I said to you afterwards, well, w there's a remarkable overlap between what you were examining and what you were proposing and what we, we have done here with Garden City, Megacity. Could you comment on what you perceive is an overlap and what the differences may be in terms of what you're proposing and what you, you see as... You were, you were very um, contemptuous of the architectural quality in Germany and by extension in Western cities, which is not something that we really talked about in our book. Could you possibly elaborate upon the issues as you see them, how they overlap with what Wohar and I have done, and um, where, yeah, what the differences are and what the similarities are? I if you could just expound on that and maybe drag Richard and Munsum in as well. Um. <coughs> I mean, you are making, in, in the book, you're making this um, analogy between the Industrial Revolution and the state that many of the emerging countries are in at the moment, India, for example, which is true to some degree, but That's probably... Mumbai. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and if, I, if I for a moment would follow that analogy, then um, many of um, the... the and, and I take my lecture as a kind of guideline, what you are doing at the moment would somehow be um, comparable to the uh, sort of housing developments in the 60s, 70s in, in say, Germany, Europe in general, the, what we would call Großsiedlungen, right? Siedlungen are the kind of, that's the German version of the Garden City. They're kind of relatively low rise and they're very, very much even in the Howard. And the Großsiedlungen are kind of trying to uh, uh, increase density and kind of bring back uh, a sense of uh, urbanity without losing the contact to nature. So, I mean, you have outside um, uh, Berlin, there's, for example, the Märkische Viertel, which was a kind of uh, a lighthouse project in for, for, the West, for West Berlin in the 1970s, which is uh, goes up to 20 floors or something like a high-rise development, also prefabricated, and it's kind of like opening itself out to parkland and, you know, trying to do everything good and, and proper. And... Uh, and if I, if I try and draw that comparison, I think actually that becomes very clear that, um, that the analogy is not quite right um, because I think you have absorbed some of the criticism, some of the lessons that have been learned already from these types of developments because your, uh, your project is much more, I mean, the for example, the grouping into, into seven villages or however many they are, um, the kind of uh, uh, the, the generosity of the access spaces, the kind of uh, visibility, the kind of piazza nature of on, on every kind of circulation floor and so on and so forth. I mean, I, I think these, these are way ahead of what's been tested at that time. And even the kind of what I was fascinated by, I mean, this whole Skyville project that you saw there is all prefabricated concrete. It's kind of like really, you'd say, cheap technology or it's kind of... Re you know, inexpensive technology, and it's 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 really uh, fantastic. I mean, the um, the amount of uh, variation you got into it, the kind of ar ar architectural expression, and also your neighbor, by the way, forget what's it called again. The Sky yeah, Sky Terrace. It, it was on the to be seen there. Yeah. It's also it's a it's a scheme which is sort of similar. It has it's more working on two levels, and it, it the idea is that it's multi generational housing with a kind of main apartment and a small apartment above so that the idea is that the mother or grandmother or mother-in-law or whatever would be living in a kind of small, maybe a child that's moving out would be living in the same compound. Not quite sure how well this works, but I mean, again, it's kind of much more, there's a social idea which somehow seems to, 
you know, have some reverberations with the with the users. Um, <coughs> but funnily enough, today these gro these Großsiedlungen they were for a long time they were it was the worst place to be. I mean, nobody wanted to live there. They were not very well connected to infrastructure and so on. And the same goes for the Plattenbau Siedlungen on uh, on the eastern side, which uh, during the time of the GDR were very popular because they were sort of privileged places to be at. Then they kind of dropped and now they're sort of starting to be very attractive again, partially because of rent issues and availability and stuff like that. But also partially maybe because these concepts have sort of come into maturity and somehow they are kind of, you know, starting to fit maybe uh, uh, the, the current situation more than they did um, at the time when they were uh, conceived and built, which is in a time in Berlin where there was not such huge pressure on the market, for example. Um, <coughs> But um, yeah, so what what do we expect for the future for housing? You know, and and of course, um, I mean, Patrick thinks that we are thinking very much alike. That I think that's on an abstract level that's maybe true. But I mean, I think that the contexts are very very different. I mean, I think Berlin is climatically very different. Obviously, it's a uh, you know in terms of population, in terms of culture, and so on and so forth. You can't really be compared to Singapore, but um, but I mean, I think what we could be learning from Singapore is this really incredible housing politics. I mean, the, the policy, the whole system is really remarkable. It would, I think, help to resolve uh, problems that we have now with the private sector here, because I mean, housing has really become a financial product. It's not, uh, you know, it's not about co life quality or whatever. It's just about s what you can sell, what you, what the market uh, uh, kind of can can take can take in a way, um, <coughs> and and of course there are, there are other issues like the sociability is a big theme because you have more than fifty percent single person households in Berlin, of the remaining fifty multi person households again about thirty five or so are single parents, and so on and so forth. I mean you know this it's a city of individuals. It's not really a city of families or households anymore. It's a city of individuals, and I think. Um, housing typologies somehow have to react to that. And I think your your projects are starting to show that, uh, starting to lead the way in, uh, to some respect. And I think on a different scale and different circumstances, we I mean, Berlin could be learning from that. Um, we were talking about um, connectivity. Um, again, I mean, your projects have this fantastic ground, flo ground floor uh, landscape. I mean, the fact that the buildings are so tall frees some of the ground. Yeah. You have these uh, um, beautiful parks, very well maintained. And what I was most impressed with is this kind of space for, cer for, for ceremonies, I mean, for weddings and funerals, um, a kind of communal big open hall at the bottom of the building, which is uh, really, uh, really very nice, quite touching, I thought. Um, so, I mean, um, these are important um, uh, moments, I think, uh, important connections, and of course, mobility, accessibility to uh, traffic networks. I mean, is is a kind of uh, Singapore in particular, with the small island that it is, is is probably something all modern developments would be wanting to share. Um, <coughs> there is a last point that I would made was a, a spirit of generosity, and actually, I'd forgotten about your generosity. Uh, rating. <laughs> I, I do think it's a good, uh, that's a very good uh, measure um, because I mean it's so, you know, that's somehow so important in that the city, the kind of spaces between the buildings in the end is as important as the apartments um, or maybe even more important as the apartments because of cost and economy and everything else have to be li minimal, standardized and so on and so forth. Um, so yes, I mean, there's there are some some parallels still. I think as a different scale, different. Are you referring to my apartment? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Which is interesting because it's built out of traffic and it's very difficult to have. But I, it is the dilemma that you give to us, but the government gives to us, which is social dilemma. The government is the general guarantor for sustainability. Right. So sociability.
Yeah, sure. But I mean, I think. S I think it's an interesting. I mean, we as humans are fascinated by what's happening. Yeah, I think you need to speak into the microphone oh, because okay. no one else understands what you're saying. <laughs> uh, what did I say? <laughs> Uh, it is the, 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 the conundrum, as I think, in the 21st century, we need uh, quite blatantly to tackle sustainability. I mean, there's no argument there. But for many years, I've been using the word sociability in, uh, uh, obviously, linguistically, it's a play on words. You've got sustainability and sociability. And I think the two of them, somehow, as human beings, and particularly you as architects, need to reconcile sociability and sustainability. We need to overcome uh, the impediments to both sustainable architecture and sociable architecture and see, see them as um, two sides of the same coin. I think there's no sustainability without sociability. That's because what I'm saying. Yeah, because you need, a, you need the complicity of, you know, there's, there's maybe an idea how things work, but you need people to buy into that idea and actually do it. And, and, you know, it's not, I think it's no coincidence that now one of the big items on the Trump agenda, you know, is, and, and Trump coming out of the divisive move movement that is somehow socially divisive, I, I think, uh, is, is to uh, undo all the climate um, uh, change agreements, you know. It's like, um, so, I mean... If this, is where, where this is where I'm intrigued that you said that... that, that <laughs> Uh, intrigued that you, you refer to my observations as purely abstract, where of course there's, no, no, there's, I think there's, you a, there's an ethical, it's the ethical dilemma that really bothers me, and of yeah. course you had to, to bring up Donald Trump, which sort of skewers the whole thing neatly, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so are there any other questions, um, any other comments? Here, yeah, Carlos. Yeah, so... Um, it seems to be that there's, on the one hand, a vision and a certain, and this manifesto, the ambition to create a uh, vision which is also expanded and diffused. And at the same time, there is uh, things which are very related to the context, as you answered in your first question. And I wanted to ask because, um, I mean, architects tend to gr uh, work more and more globally as they grow up uh, in science and in experience. Um, how, how does that work for you? I mean, first of all, do you think it makes sense for that to happen? And if so, which I presume, okay, um, how do you approach such situations when you're working on a context which is not the Singaporean uh, examples that we've seen, which are really exceptional and for us really somehow different from our experience and our context? Uh, yeah, we are... We have sort of slowly started working further and further from Singapore, and it 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 does highlight to us how specific uh, each culture and building industry really is, uh, and and the sort of uh, the different values people uh, ascribe to different things about public realm and privacy and and the commons. Uh, but I think as long as we're um, not selling a solution, but maybe s m maybe we just come with a certain attitude that that this idea that the commons is something that uh, is really important. Yeah, and if we are becoming a society of individuals, uh, we need to at least make environments that enable people to come together in different ways, uh, rather than just talking about all the time privacy and separation. Um, yeah, that if I think with a cautious attitude and a good sense of the potential downside and risks, <laughs> uh, it's something interesting to to attempt. And what is heartening to us is, you know, people who seem to have no need for these kind of buildings. You know, maybe it's uh, Japan or or Europe with a shrinking population. Maybe that people say, we still find this an appealing way to live, and we're interested in it. Um, is something that's very heartening, I think, um, and and strange actually that many people from places uh, like Germany, you know, where it, it's quite there's a quite a lot of discomfort with high rise and high high density, actually react very positively to it. And so, just I think it just opens the door to more diversity, maybe, 
uh, but what that diversity is is something that has to be worked through very carefully. What are some of the things which you learned not to do in your practice? What are some of the failures over the years? I think we, we, we learn not to, what we learn not to do is to take on projects that are um, too commercial in nature. And I think we do seek out jobs and clients that um, do see eye to eye with some of our I think really that really is quite important, and when and and there are some pr some places that we do not uh, practice in, where we feel it's just absolutely not the right type of people and the right climate for us to to work in. So we we do. It's not a failure, but. <laughs> No, I think we have had failures. We've one thing we have learned over the years is no matter how uh, enticing or exciting a vision is, unless there's um, some kind of uh, structure or organisation that takes responsibility and ownership of what we're proposing, then it's doomed to failure. Uh, we did a couple of media screens, for instance, with um, Jan and Tim at Realities United, which were fantastic and worked so well and even though we'd worked through all the issues with content you know it's always very difficult to generate content for it and they did fantastic things where one uh, uh, one of the media screens would actually go into dream mode so it played advertisements in the day and then it it like had a psychedelic dream about those advertisements at night so it consumed commercial content even then because the and the development team loved it and the developer and everything but once they handed it over to the facilities manager they never even turned it on. It's like it just required someone to <laughs> flick a switch, uh, and yet that was too much. So I think it, we're much more cautious now about like saying who, who is going to take this over, how much are they invested in it, does it line up with their key performance indicators, uh, and if it falls between two groups or it makes a difficult boundary between overlapping responsibilities, uh, it's very likely to fail. So I think we've learned a lot more about the uh, sort of political and organisational structures and how they interact with architecture and built space or with gardens and things. And we, we're we much smarter now, I think, about working with that than we were at the beginning. Any other questions? Yeah, please. So I guess just a little bit more generally speaking, um, obviously you've uh, enjoyed um, a really rich career and you are um, still very active. Um, but I'm wondering what do you tell young practitioners or like what do you tell the younger generation? Or I guess what, what do you wish you had um, known when you were starting? <laughs> we wish we were still young. <laughs> um, I guess I think it's, I can't remember who told me, but it was good advice. I think that it was, uh, someone told me, Glenn Merkett's father told him that the compromises you make on this job will be the highest standard you achieve on the next one. And I think that was, uh, I don't think it's true actually, because I think every job is different. <laughs> Um, but I think it is really important as a young practitioner to sort of keep the idealism and keep the passion, uh, but really temper it with the knowledge that I think as an architect, we're not really here to fulfill our own dreams, but we have to be some kind of conduit for uh, the end users and society's dreams, and we can guide it in some way, but it's not really um, about us in the end and I think where we've been sort of successful is Tai Chiing 
through our aspirations, but really um, engaging all the stakeholders in the project and, and, and developing a story um, and a narrative that everybody feels their, um, their ambitions and their dreams are embodied in the, the built project. And in some ways that's more important than any kind of uh, skill or formal manipulation or detailing expertise is just this ability to um, to make everybody feel like this project is something that they have a, a stake in and that they've been listened to and when it's built they can sort of point proudly to it and explain why uh, why they were a big part of it and why it made a lot of sense for them uh, and so that is something I think when you're younger you automatically assume people are on board with what you're doing um, it's usually not the case and projects can really devolve into everybody tearing at it to in a different direction because they have different um, uh, outcomes that they hope for for the pro project uh, so this this uh, storyline and narrative uh, development which we do always I think at the beginning of the project trying to find a way to align all the various vectors in the project into some kind of unified direction um, that's what I think is something we we learned quite early on, but we wish to be probably known it clearer from the beginning. Yeah, we've seen a lot of green in your in your projects. A lot of plants you implement in your designs. I think there's not a, not a single building in Berlin which can compare to that. So uh, very nice to see that. We've seen the social aspects uh, being implemented in your designs. Uh, I wonder a bit about um, sustainable energy concepts. Um, I wonder, are you uh, implementing that or integrating that as well, like solar panels, or whatever, wind, um, earth, whatever, earth, earth warmness, st stuff like that? The, yes, um, I think some of them you may have seen solar panels. The public housing has a whole canopy of solar panels on top. But Singapore is actually quite a challenging climate uh, for um, sustainable energy. Very, very low wind. Uh, we have um, the ground temperature is because it's on the equator and uh, the ground temperature basically settles at the average annual temperature. So our ground in Singapore is about 28 degrees Celsius. So there's no cooling available from the ground. Uh, the sea and the water is also uh, the same temperature as <laughs> that. Uh, and we have very little wave or um, tides uh, as well. So it's, it's quite a difficult project for that. Photovoltaic does work quite well in Singapore, and the, but until recently they had a, um, a regulatory problem that you weren't allowed to sell power unless you are a registered uh, energy um, authority um, and so uh, it was actually in many cases you um, you could only create enough power for common uh, services such as corridor lighting and things like that but you couldn't sell it to uh, tenants of the building so they've been recently unpicking all those regulations and making sure it uh, works at the same time they're starting to implement uh, national schemes like floating photovoltaic panels on the reservoir uh, water um, but it's uh, I would say Singapore is quite a laggard in this and because of the very high density we have difficulty having enough access to sunlight for so many floors of buildings uh, we're working with the university on the uh, solar potential of Singapore and optimum building heights uh, and in one study we did, it worked out about 10 or 11 stories uh, and with a big cantilevered canopy, you could get enough energy for the, um, for the building below it. Uh, so it's, I think it's something you'll definitely see more of as we go forward, but it's, it's surprisingly, because you would think the tropics is the highest, eni highest uh, energy environment on the planet, so it should be very easy. But the energy is somehow very diffuse in uh, humidity and thunderstorms and <laughs> things like that, uh, and in uh, rampant plant growth. So you know there's some potential for for um, biofuel generation. 
uh, I, I recommend difficult. I recommend the book actually because um, <coughs> they're proposing some um, zero carbon um, development, which mm. obviously includes uh, alternative uh, energies. So there was a question here. Thanks very much for a great talk. Um, I'm uh, Scott Hawkins from Sydney, and I was really interested in the biological component of your buildings. And um, whether you consider, w w could you talk a bit more about how are they a, a part of the civic generosity that you see as, um, as the, the green contributing to the buildings or part of, a, I guess, a harder sustainable efficiency that they're delivering? And you know, I was also curious to know how many gardeners you have working on your buildings. I know there's a, um, a, lot, a lot of uh, energy um, to care for these buildings, so in terms of their green systems. Yeah, I, it's actually very interesting because you're when you start doing planting and building, you're forced to confront a whole lot of uh, sort of philosophical and cultural and scientific aspects of of plants and nature, and it's actually a very very tangled and interesting uh, field. What we have done, I think, is. In a way, we're, we're fairly interested in all these aspects of it. And I think in each case, you just need to be very clear why you're doing it. So in some cases, you might say, you know, this um, is a, um, it's a shading device. It's a civic generosity kind of urban gesture. People outside enjoy the plants. It's not a garden to play in. It's not uh, something else. Or, you know, you might say this is a... a a romantic uh, and and beautiful gesture, but it's not performing, you know, other kind of tasks as well. Uh, so I think it's uh, it's sort of all correct and it's all true and it's all aspects of of plants and nature. And as long as you're really clear as to what uh, performative or environmental or cultural or recreational or social kind of aims you're t you're wanting to get out of the planting, then it should work very well. Uh, just the final one on that, the how many gardeners, is what we've generally tried to do is make sure you don't need special equipment to maintain the plants. So even the Oasia Hotel with the green growing all over the screens, behind the screen, you can just get to it off the lift, walk around the corridor behind it, and basically do the maintenance uh, just standing there behind the, s the screens. Uh, and I think that's, once you've done that, then the cost of maintaining it is really very comparable to maintaining the same area of landscape on the ground. Uh, and so that's not prohibitive. If you like, um, the project in, uh, in, in Sydney, um, the um, Central Park, it, where you need to abseil down and you need a qualified mountain climber who's also a gardener, then you're looking at something quite complex in terms of managing people with those skills and you know, making sure if someone gets sick, uh, you know, there's no one else in the city who could do such a task. I think that's, uh, uh, it's exciting, but it's definitely, uh, it's a commitment to long-term maintenance that you need to spend the money on it. Uh, and so, uh, and there's, uh, I think, expectations of end users and the public too. You know, in some places, people find a wild, unkempt meadow um, sort of thing is something very beautiful while another group of people may find it just looks dirty and messy and uncared for and they find it very unsightly. So that whole sort of cultural aspect about how people respond to different types of landscaping needs to be taken into account uh, as well. Any other questions? At the back there. Hello. I just wondered, this might already have been covered, if uh, you are also influenced in your work uh, with the concept of permaculture. The concept of permaculture. Mm. I will more listen from Australia, kind of the idea of... Uh, at a broad sort of knowing it exists. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yes. 
where we've been wanting to push it is in terms of um, ecosystems at the moment. Um, but I think it's again one of those things, once you've created the sort of infrastructure and possibility of more gardens, then you get the wonderful question of what do you want to do with this um, potential? And I think in a, in a diverse city to have permaculture gardens and, and urban food production and urban forestry as well as plants and animals and uh, insects and birds, all these things are, are wonderful and the reason we're doing it, I think. So it's, um, uh, there's no limit to the kind of landscapes, I think, that we can provide on buildings. I thought actually that your um, time-lapse video of the Oasis Hotel is really incredible. Um, you should go next door if you have time the next few days. There's an exhibition of Peter Cook's drawings, a retrospective of his drawings, and really is his his architecture come alive. You know, it's this kind of vision of a, a sort of second, third nature, whatever you want to call it, architecture sort of behaving like a natural phenomenon. It's uh, It's really fabulous, unbelievable, really good. And I mean, I, I can report from um, uh, first hand that uh, these plants are really alive and uh, <laughs> and they are quite robust. Uh, they're not close by, they're not quite as romantic as your little bumblebee suggests there, uh, but I mean, they're, you know, they're just sort of like, something like knöterich or something like that. Um, so <laughs> quite a quite a robust thing, but they're growing like hell and uh, and it's, it's very successful when you see it on their buildings that are partially older. Um, uh, how they're kind of covering the whole uh, facades. I mean, that's obviously something to do with the climate. Yeah. So uh, are there any more urgent questions, suggestions, comments to make? In which case, I think I will relieve you of your duty because you both look a little bit jet-lagged. It's <laughs> true. And uh, thank you very much for uh, you know, this yeah. introduction. Yeah. Well, thank you, Matthias. Well, uh, Again, we should be thanking you, <laughs> not you thanking us. So. Let me just say again, it's a it's a really fabulous book to have done, um, and uh, congratulations on it. So thank you, thank you very much.